go back a few hundred years to the late 1700s. What would you see in America? What would you see in Boston? You'd see people dying of cholera. South to New York City and Philadelphia, you'd see people dying of yellow fever. Little south of there, all across America, you'd see people dying of malaria. In my hometown of New York, the death rate from yellow fever was so great, it dwarfs the death rate from HIV and AIDS in the height of the epidemic of the 80s and 90s. The death rate from cholera in New York City was so great in the mid-1800s, if you transposed it to the population of New York City today, it would be hundreds of thousands of people dying a year. Hundreds of thousands of people dying a year. The working assumption about all these diseases was that they're God's will. They've always been here, always will be. They're a natural part of the environment, like the Charles River or the Hudson River. There's nothing we can do about them. Certainly humans are impotent to end them. Maybe we can have a little excess charity. Maybe people can be a little marginally less miserable as they die inevitable, horrible deaths. So maybe we'll have a little charities come in and wipe off their brows so they'll have just a little less suffering as they're dying. And people with money assumed that the only reason these diseases were more prevalent in low-income neighborhoods was that there was something intrinsically wrong with low-income people. They deserved it. It was God's will. This was punishment. Punishment for the sin of being poor. They were lazy, they were drinking, whatever. Now, show of hands, you didn't know you were going to get tested. Now, some of you have been the Peace Corps, etc., traveled. Let me be very specific. Raise your hand if you've ever contracted cholera, yellow fever, or malaria while in the United States. We have at least one MD here, so I'm going to expand the question. Raise your hand if you know anyone that's contracted malaria, cholera, or yellow fever in the United States. What happened? They're warm weather diseases. Today, notwithstanding, North America's gotten warmer. They're prevalent throughout the rest of the world. There are people still dying every day of cholera, yellow fever, and malaria overseas. What happened? Where'd they go? Why don't we have people dying from malaria, yellow fever, and cholera anymore? Answer. Government wiped them out. Government wiped them out. Why do I start my hunger talks with this? Because the single biggest problem we have in America today is people who didn't believe government could work got in government and set out to prove it couldn't work by messing it up and showing that nothing works. And they've sold the country on the bill of goods that we're incapable of a society, as a society of solving big problems. The same failed assumptions we had a few hundred years ago about poverty and hunger are the same failed assumptions we have today. People believe they're here, they've always been here, they're a natural part of the human environment, people are hungry or poor because they're lazy, they're bums, they're drinking, they're drugged out. Maybe we can have a little charity so people will be marginally less miserable, but we can't wipe them out. And we forget, and City Year never forgets this, but others forget, that in a democracy, in a democracy, government is the embodiment of community. Government is the embodiment of community. So people say, Joel, why are you talking about this food stamps? Why are you talking about minimum wage? Why are you talking about school breakfast? Why not let the community solve it instead of the government? Let the community solve it. Say, in a democracy, properly functioning, government is the embodiment of community. I run a nonprofit group. I love my board of directors. They're fine, upstanding citizens, but there are eight people who picked me. Commissioner Keogh was picked by a governor who was elected by the people of New York State. She has legitimacy. I don't. Whatever you think about government, not you particularly, I'm not saying you don't, but all elected officials and appointed officials, and we've been so brainwashed in American history into thinking we can't solve big problems. In my book, All You Can Eat, How Hungry Is America, I go through the history of hunger in America and proved it was not a fixed point. It used to be worse, 
then got better, then got worse again because of governmental and human economic actions, not just because that's how stuff happens. So one of the best finds in my book, I found a master thesis by Frances Perkins. Frances Perkins, you may remember the name if you've been to Washington, D.C. The Labor Department building is named after her. She was the first uh, United States cabinet secretary who was a woman. She was the first New York State cabinet secretary who was a woman, a shocking proposition back then. But I found out she wrote her master's thesis at Columbia in 1910 on hunger among children in New York City. And I, I rarely read at these things, but this is a book reading, so I have to read a quote what she found. And, and she basically found the kids were starving to death. Maybe they'd have a little coffee, a little tea, that was a common drink. Maybe they'd have a little polenta, not to be stereotypical, but this is what her log said. If they're Italian, they have a little polenta. If they're Irish, they have a little potatoes. Rarely meat, rarely fresh bread, virtually never milk. And one or two meals a day if they were lucky. School meals didn't exist yet in America. There was one pilot school meals program in Chicago. This paper led to a pilot school meals program in New York. But here's what she found, one of the people. One of the children was an Italian boy with a continual pain in his chest and a bad cough which lasted two years. The father is a cobbler making $7 or $8 a week, and the family lives in the basement rooms in back of the shop. The lad with the pain in his chest lives in a semi-dark, damp room and eats little besides macaroni, bread, and coffee. One further element of hopelessness is that he now has turned 14 he has taken his working papers and must get a factory job at once. We don't have child labor, at least legal child labor, in America anymore. We don't have kids starving to death. I'll talk about what hunger in America is, but it's not that. Things are better. You know why? We developed a government safety net. President Roosevelt started a pilot food stamps program. Uh, the generals came to President Truman after World War II and said, Mr. President, our boys are too weak and malnourished to fight. I hate to be sexist, but it was mostly men fighting men. And out of that, they created the school lunch program as a defense program. Uh, Senator Richard Russell, in many ways, a, a horrible blot on American history. He was an ardent segregationist, and nothing ever he did else besides that, I think, could remove that blot. But he did do one very important thing. He helped create the school lunch program. And later on, he was asked of all the things he had done, what was the best thing he had done in government? And he said the school lunch program. Then, as I talked about, President Kennedy started the pilot school meals, uh, pilot food stamps program up again. Uh, he expanded commodity distribution. And in the late 1960s, there was a mass movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King, the Poor People's Movement. And I knew it was generally an anti-poverty movement. I didn't understand until I did the research for my book that their central demand, the central demand of Dr. King's Poor People's Movement was ensuring that there was a federal nutrition assistance safety net so Americans weren't going hungry. He once said, what good is it that a man has the right to eat at a lunch counter if he can't afford a hamburger? 